Um, so the last speaker we're going to have today is uh, Francois Bélis. Uh, and Francois is actually a philosopher. So one of the biggest questions, of course, and it's been alluded to uh, throughout the past two days, uh, is the, the ethical implications of the research involving gene editing. And we've been through this before, not so long ago, with uh, human stem cells and uh, stem cell biology and stem cell uh, science. Uh, so it's, it's uh, a really good example. In fact, Janet uh, still has, um, uh, has, a, a major, has had a major impact in how stem cell technologies have been developed and uh, uh, um, um, uh, ethically applied in, in Canada and elsewhere. Um, so Francois is, 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 is going to tell us what, uh, what she's been working on in terms of the ethics um, and some of the morality associated with, with gene editing. And I think if for anybody in the audience who is working on this technology, this is incredibly important because if we don't get this right, it will actually be an effective genetic silencer of this, the application of this type of technology. Uh, and so I think every scientist working in this field uh, will owe a debt of honor uh, to people like Francois uh, and the work they're doing. Francois. Oh, I should also mention Francois is a a Canada Research Chair, she's uh, from the University uh, of, uh, uh, from Dalhousie University uh, in uh, Nova Scotia. Welcome. Well, thank you very much for staying. And uh, I hope that for some of you at least, it'll sort of put another kind of perspective on a lot of the science that you've been hearing about for the past couple of days. So one of the things that I'm going to be committed to sharing with you is my view that in order for the science to move forward in a way that ultimately will be helpful for people, we need to broaden the conversation. And so that's largely what today's talk is going to be about. So the first thing that I want to do is just provide you with a quick and dirty overview of what I'm hoping to cover in the time that we have. And I want to talk a little bit about the international summit that took place in Washington in December of 2015. I was a member of that planning committee and so have a particular perspective on what went into the planning for that meeting and what that meeting was about and what that meeting should in fact spawn. And I want to suggest, and this is my perspective, that it was an unwitting call for slow science. Having said that, I'm then going to take some time to, to explain what I mean by that term. So what does it mean to talk about slow science and what are the benefits of slow science? And I'm going to interpret that in a particular way to say that it's about a commitment to the democratization of science and it's also a commitment to have the time that's necessary to exercise the moral imagination. And then I want to end with a little bit of comments about what I think might be interesting and appropriate roles for scientists in the context of the CRISPR conversation, recognizing that in many contexts this is about moving towards policy, regulations, etc. Um, and I think that there, part of what I'm going to be saying, and I hope it's clear throughout my remarks, I have a very deep commitment to both science literacy and ethics literacy. And I believe they have to go hand in hand. And I think just as some people are going to feel very confident about the science and perhaps less so about the ethics, we need to think about the reverse. Those who think they're pretty confident about their ethics because they were all brought up well by their parents, et cetera, um, might need to have some, some work done around the science. The two have to go hand in hand, and I don't think that we've reached that point yet. So let me take you back in time to all of last year. So some of you who were here yesterday will have had a much more in interesting and long uh, version of the history of CRISPR, but I want to talk about just what happened last year. So first we had an article published in March of 2015 calling for a voluntary moratorium. And one of the things that's interesting is that the moratorium is specifically with respect to interventions in the germline, and it's specifically from the perspective of a number of scientists who are deeply committed and engaged in doing CRISPR science in the context of somatic cell interventions with a view to developing therapies, and they're actually quite worried that if people keep getting exercised about what might or might not happen in the germline, that some really good science that could be used for the treatment of patients will get sidelined. And so, in part, in an effort to sort of protect an area of science that they think is very important, that's on the cusp of moving into clinical trials, they're saying we ought to have a moratorium on any kind of intervention into the germline. 
And that's the piece that comes out in nature. And then shortly thereafter, we get another piece in science. It's about three weeks, maybe a, a month later. And the language is slightly different. Um, there's no use of the term moratorium. There's this broad statement that what we want to have is to strongly discourage clinical use. Strongly discourage clinical use. What they're trying to do in this piece is actually hold on to any work that might be happening in the laboratory and trying to draw a distinction there to say, look, we're not saying anything about what you're doing in the lab. We're saying don't take it out of the lab into the clinical setting in terms of clinical trials. And so we hear and we see in the title the language of a prudent path forward. So very worried about anything that would smack of a moratorium that might then get understood as a ban and that might in some sense then take some of the science off track. Both of these papers are written in anticipation that we're going to be hearing about the very science we do hear about about a week later, where a number of uh, Chinese scientists had in fact been manipulating non-viable human embryos in the context of trying to develop interventions for beta thalassemia. As a result of these two publications and some conversations in the scientific community, a decision is made with help from the National Academy of Sciences in the United States, that they would hold a meeting and start a conversation about this issue. Planning for that meeting starts in early fall, and in the midst of that planning, in early October, UNESCO issues this statement calling for a ban. And I want to make the point here that this is going further than calling for a moratorium. When we think about a moratorium, we're thinking typically about putting some kind of a pause in place. Very often, if you have a moratorium, it will be time limited. And the idea is that there's a commitment to come back and to renew on the basis of new information, perhaps a change in mores or something like that, whereas a ban seems a pretty draconian and dramatic kind of comment or perspective. Now, one of the things that's interesting is that when UNESCO actually issues this call for a ban, they actually say something along the lines of, it's a reasonable place to draw a line against human hubris. So one of the things then that becomes really interesting to think about in this whole area of science, and at least that's one of the things I'm going to push on as a theme, is how do we think about humility and hubris in this particular area of science, where from my perspective, what we're really ultimately talking about is taking over the evolutionary story. And the language I use for that is I talk about embracing volitional evolution. Well, that's a pretty big thing to think we would do that. And so I think it's not surprising that you would have some people think about this along this axis of humility and hubris. So that's what we hear from UNESCO. Now this is October of 2015. And from that we move into the International Summit which takes place in December of 2015. And I already shared with you that I was a member of the planning committee. And this is a photograph of the planning committee at the end of the meeting. And I want you to appreciate two things. One of them is that everybody with the great colorful ties it's on the left side of the picture. And the other thing is that there are two women. There was, in fact, a third woman who wasn't able to be there for the picture. And I am the only non-scientist. And I draw that to your attention only to say we ought to think about how we both set up the membership of small committees or bigger committees because the fact of the matter is conversations that happen in those committees are very much affected by where one is situated from. So anybody who knows me or knows my work will tell you that I have a lot of confidence in the things I say. I'm a pretty tough cookie. Um, it's really hard surrounded by all these eminent scientists to push on any particular agenda. So I'm just inviting you, as I go through the decision making there, to think about how that conversation might have been different if the makeup of the committee had been any different. Now when I say that, I want to say it was a huge privilege to participate in that meeting, and I learned a tremendous amount. So one of the things that happens at that meeting is that there's a lot of conversation by a range of scientists identifying what they believe are the harms and part of the reason they're doing that is because they're then going to also remind us of what are the benefits. And that fits within an ethics discourse of a particular type. Technically, we refer to that as utilitarianism. Technically, we think about that as weighing up the harms and the benefits. And ideally, what you're wanting to do is to maximize the benefits for all peoples. And so it makes sense. Let's figure out what are all the harms and how can we make sure that the benefits we're going after and that will accrue will outweigh those harms. <clears throat> 
And when you look at these harms, they are the sorts of things that you might be familiar with, and we've heard about some of that already during the meetings today. And these are the kinds of things that people would be concerned about because in the context of eventually moving into the clinical setting, you would have to be making a very robust argument, not only to the regulatory agencies, but also to your research ethics boards, committees, IRBs, depending on what country you're working in, saying that you're good to go, that you're reasonably confident in both the safety and the efficacy of the intervention, and that it is reasonable to make that leap, to move from a particular animal model into the human. And so these are the kinds of things that you would need to be able to address. And then we heard a lot about the benefits of this intervention. And those were actually talked about typically in the context of both cures and enhancements. And I put them together here, but I do want to acknowledge that some people actually thought about enhancements on the harm side of the equation. And one of the things that I want to underline there is to already show you how even when you're trying to pull together the harms and the benefits, that even what side you choose to put them on is in fact making clear a particular kind of value commitment. If you think an enhancement is a benefit, it actually says something about where you're positioned. If you think an enhancement of the human is a harm, it says something. I've decided to put it on this side of the equation because there certainly were philosophers there arguing that this is great. Um, these are people who are particularly committed to uh, embracing transhumanism, and they think that we're in fact a flawed model, and why wouldn't we use our smarts to make ourselves better? So in that context, there was also a clear delineation between interventions that would happen in somatic cells and interventions that would happen in germ cells. And typically, we're looking at a range of treatments for different kinds of disorders. And again, we've heard about some of those here. And then we'd also heard a number of people saying, look, even through um, somatic interventions, you could in fact have an effect on the germline and that we should be thinking about making those kinds of enhancements as well. When it came to looking at germ cells, it was a commitment to think about it in terms of the work that can happen in basic science. Also a concern to think about this in the context of, well, why just fix the human that's in front of us, the patient, when in fact their progeny is likely to have the very same problem? Why don't we be a whole lot more effective and one time cure both the patient and their offspring? And then beyond that, you had some enthusiasts for actually making enhancements in the germline. And as I said, for some people, that actually ended up on the harmful side of the equation. There were some people at the meeting that tried to say, look, it's not just about harms and benefits at the individual level. And we really need to be thinking about this in the context of issues of social justice. And so it was to say, look, there aren't just medical benefits and there aren't just potential social harms. Um, we need to think beyond that. And really the emphasis here was on exacerbating existing inequalities. And people were reminding us about how at one time many important credible scientists were very excited about eugenics. And what if this is today's equivalent of that? And 20 or 30 years down the road, people are looking back saying, how could they possibly have thought that this was a good thing? And so those are the kinds of other kinds of perspectives that were brought forward. I wanted people to talk about what would it mean to weaponize this science. We didn't get very far down that pathway, and it's not because obviously I'm an advocate of that, but I'm trying to say, if you're gonna go and do this work, let's think creatively, exercise the moral imagination. Where is it going to go? And I really wanna emphasize that in terms of exercising the moral imagination, because very often I've had a number of scientists say to me, look, knowledge is actually neutral. It's up to other people how it gets used. And they'll be very quick to point out that if you take a hammer, it can be a fantastic tool for building a house for someone who doesn't have a home. It's also a great tool for the judge who uses it as a gavel, and it's also a potential murder weapon. And so in the same way, people would say, look, there's nothing wrong about going out there, getting the knowledge, understanding the science, and wanting to have it be used for good ends. I can't control the yahoo out there who's going to try and use it for some other kinds of ends the example being weaponizing this science. But in a contemporary context, how can we not talk about that at the same time that we talk about all the other potential benefits that we can see? But now I wanna share with you some of the things that didn't get on that agenda at all that I think are really important research questions and ethics questions. And here's the intersection and then I'm gonna go beyond that. We didn't actually pull back and just look about the ethics of research and how we do that right now. And a lot of people might say, well, that's because it's not specific to CRISPR. 
And in some sense, that's true, but it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be addressed in that context. And I think there's some very important questions to be asked in this area that tie back to issues of social justice. So if we just look at the question about addressing public funding for basic science, that has an implication on what funds might or might not be available in this arena. If we actually talk about what are the standards for improving research reproducibility, that too becomes particularly important in this context. I don't need to read through all of these examples. I just want to make the point that when you look at CRISPR and you say, well, let's look at the ethics of CRISPR, it's easy to stay focused narrowly on what's this new novel intervention, when in point of fact, it's part of a much bigger enterprise. And there are, in fact, lots of improvements that could be made in the context of research ethics writ large. But beyond that, I'm a philosopher, and so I'm actually interested in even bigger questions. And so unlike others who want to zoom in and just talk narrowly about CRISPR, I want to keep pulling us back out so that we're asking bigger and bigger questions, because the bigger the question, the tougher it is to get to an answer. But ultimately, that's what will drive and set the direction, the path for the science. So one of the things that I think is absolutely critical to ask, without having any commitment to a particular answer, what are the opportunity costs associated with investments in this area of science? It's just an open-ended question. It's exciting. There's lots of potential. But there are only so many research dollars, at least if you're thinking in terms of the public purse, but possibly also in the private sector. And when we actually make a commitment to invest in one area, there's the very real potential we're not going to invest in another. And I will say back to you, having worked in this area for a very long time, this was particularly acute in the context of stem cell research when all of a sudden people were talking about iPS cells. And I can tell you that at least from the perspective of certain funders, they were asking the scientists point blank, how much of my budget do I now give to embryonic stem cell research versus how much of my budget do I give to iPS cells? And I can tell you in terms of the circles I was moving in at the time, a number of the scientists were talking to each other and saying, well, we got to stick together on this, right, because we don't want to lose our funding. We can't break ranks, right? We are going to tell the funders it's really, really important that they continue to invest in embryonic stem cell research. IPS work is great, too, but you need us as the comparator, blah, blah, blah. And then I was at a meeting where they were talking about Framework 7, and a scientist broke ranks and said, if I had to make that choice, I'd put it all into IPS cells. Now, I'm not saying what's right or wrong. I'm just saying there are decisions to be made. And that's a question worth asking in this area as well. You know, how might certain commercialization strategies hinder public health goals? We've heard a lot about a number of very important public health goals. But as we're looking at mixes of public and private funding, how do certain kinds of commitments or strategies perhaps hinder our ability to achieve those goals for the benefit of humankind? What's the right balance between increasing reproductive options and social justice? I think these are really critical questions. And I think, you know, from an even broader perspective, we need to understand that at least at that meeting in December, there were a number of people on Twitter. And I have to say to you, it's the first meeting that I went to where I was in attendance at the meeting, and I had the Twitter feed open the whole time. And I will tell you, it was like as if I was attending two different conferences. Really, the conversation on the Twitter feed was completely different, and in part, it's because there were a number of people from the disabilities groups that were paying attention on Twitter, a number of uh, people interested from an animal rights and animal welfare perspective, and they were having a completely different conversation. I often thought it would have been amazing if we could have somehow promised people anonymity and actually shown those comments as they were uh, being scrolled on the Twitter feed. And the last example I put up there is, what about the use of this technology for art or for war? So I already made reference to weaponization, but I remember the early days of embryo research where, as a statement, an artist actually had a number of embryos in little test tubes, that's what she claimed they were, um, you know, walking around to make a political statement. And so I think one of the things we need to think about are people who work in different arenas who actually force us to engage the imagination. Another thing that we didn't talk about, but it's because of the work that I do in assisted reproduction that I'm quite interested in is, what do we know or think about what happens in the IVF clinics? Those are really important sites. I mean, that's where you're getting your research material if you're thinking about germline interventions, and that's where you're going to be looking to do uh, clinical trials. What do people here in basic science know about what happens in that place called the IVF clinic? I've already made reference to this notion of volitional evolution or transhumanism. Is that a worthy goal? Or do we just pretend that's not part of what we're actually doing? 
And my favorite question, what does it mean to be human? I don't have the answer, but I first started thinking about that in terms of some of the work that I did around chimeras. And I think it's really interesting to ask that question. And the last one that I think also is worth thinking about, we have a number of problems, and this refers to some of the things that I've said around opportunity costs. Remember, I've said I do a lot of work in assisted reproduction, therefore I'm often engaging with questions about people's reproductive choices. But I have to tell you, at some point I have to pull back and I have to say, really? In a context where we've got problems of climate change, we've got problems of food security, we've got problems of environmental degradation, we've got problems of overpopulation, what am I saying? Well, how do we fix all those problems? Do we tar start thinking about changing the biology of the human? Do we start thinking about changing the planet? Or do we just make plans to get off the planet and change the human to live on whatever other planet we think we're going to go to? One of the things that I also find fascinating in this context is how all of us in different ways are committed to living forever, either as individuals or as a species. And then you want to say, don't we believe in Darwin? Isn't it going to be the case that our species won't exist at some point, and it shouldn't, assuming Darwin was right? And that's why I think it becomes really interesting to think about, well, is it then just about taking over that evolutionary project and saying we can make it be different by virtue of imposing on it human choice? In the little bit of time that I have left, what I want to do is I want to actually take you through the conclusions that came out of that meeting, having had a couple of days of robust conversation. So one of the conclusions, basically, in short, was to say that the basic preclinical research should continue. And one of the things that becomes very important there is it's about saying the work that's happening in the lab that's about basic knowledge production shouldn't be hindered. And I can tell you, a number of people would have been very happy about that outcome. This is a picture of Kathy Nyakin and uh, also uh, Frederick Lanner, who, uh, Kathy was the first person to actually apply for a license to do work in the human embryo, gene editing work in the human embryo, and that license was granted. And Frederick Lanner is actually the first person to have actually done that, um, and with the approval of a research ethics committee. And so they, of course, would have been quite happy to know that they could go forward with their science on the basis of that recommendation. The second recommendation was specifically about somatic cell use uh, research, and one of the things there was not just about the research that was already ongoing, but how to move, and at the time there were a number of presentations on zinc finger, talons, et cetera, but with CRISPR-Cas9 as the next frontier. And in fact, it was to say that that research as well could go forward. And a number of people, a number of companies, would have been extremely happy with that conclusion because it meant that they still had a platform to go on and do that work. And we have heard since then about a number of efforts to, in fact, move that into clinical trials. The third recommendation, which really was dealing with the issue that had started the drive for this meeting, was about the use of uh, gene editing in the context of the germline. This is the conclusion that they came up with. And you'll notice that from my perspective, it's a very interesting framework. And it's a very simple framework because there's really only two things you need to do. You need to be sure about the safety and efficacy, and you need to have broad societal consensus. It's absolutely great that it's a two-part decision-making framework, and we don't know what either of those parts mean, right? You know, and when I say that, even when you think about something like safety and efficacy, which many of you will know a lot about in the abstract, in this particular area, germline genetic intervention, the critical ethics question is, when are you good to go? So from an ethics perspective, it's actually not a question about consent, it's a question about trial design. It's a question about the inferential gap. It's a question about translational distance. How narrow can you get the gap in terms of what you don't know to be able to ethically justify saying it's worth doing in the human? It's a huge question. We don't know what that is. And broad societal consensus, well, if you know what that is, tell me, because I sure don't know. Now, I want to say to you, I advocated very strongly for that language. Beyond that, I actually advocated for the use of the term moratorium around this particular statement, um, and I was not persuaded I was not able to persuade my colleagues. And the reason I want to say that is because I said to them, look, it doesn't matter. If you've put that word in there, broad societal consensus, which I'm very happy with, everybody's going to know that it ultimately means a moratorium. And then the answer is, yep, but we're not calling it that. And so one of the things that's very interesting to me in the context of ethics is what we think language does. Because the general public certainly understood that to be some kind of a moratorium. And the way in which it was written 
It doesn't actually even have a timeline, which a moratorium often can have. We can say this is a temporary thing and it expires and it has an expiry date on the moratorium and so you better be thinking about what you're going to do because once that moratorium is over, it's wide open again. Anyhow, the point that I want to make there is what do we mean by broad societal consensus and that's what takes me back to my claim that I think what that is was an unwitting call for slow science. Slow science is actually a manifesto. It comes out of folks in Europe. And basically, the claim they're making is that science needs time to think. It needs time to read. It needs time to fail. It doesn't always know what it might be at, at any one time. So it's about discussing. It's about wonder. It's about thinking. And what I want to suggest to you in the context of slow science is we need to actually pull back and interrogate in a really thoughtful way, what might be, what should be, the ends, the goals, the objectives are of our interventions. It's relatively easy to say it's about patient care. I mean, who's against that? That's mom and apple pie. I'm not going to stand up here and say, no, we don't want to help patients. It's not about that. It's about saying beyond that, what are the implications? What are we as a society saying we care about depending on where we put our resources? depending on where we choose which diseases or disorders we think are worthy of investigating. What does it mean to have science that ultimately isn't driven by financial considerations and so doesn't have to constantly promise cures and deliverables? And I have to tell you, that doesn't even only have to do with what might be seen as government funders, whether it be NIH, whether it be CIHR, et cetera. I mean, when you go out to philanthropists, when you go out to the average person, when you're knocking on my door to say, Francoise, will you make a donation? You say, I'm running for the cure. You don't say, well, I'm running so that somebody can do some work in a mouse who's going to understand a little bit more about what cancer might or might not do. I mean, that's not the story. But you know what, I'm going to say to you that at least Canadians, and I would say people around the world, they're entitled to actually hear that second story. It's a harder story to tell and encapsulate, but it's actually the truth, right? And we ought to find a way to actually educate our population such that they'll actually really support what we're doing, as opposed to promising them things that we can't and don't deliver on, and then they're disappointed. How long have we promised gene therapies? I'll date myself. <laughs> I actually worked on the CIHR guidelines for somatic cell therapy, and that was back in the 80s and 90s. We want science that aims to make the world a better place through benefit sharing, but you know what? We don't even understand how to do the benefit sharing in a meaningful way. And it's not to say that we haven't got good intuitions and good objectives. We actually don't often know how to actually make them come together. And then science that promotes knowledge sharing I don't have to say anything to you in this room about the big patent fight. Last I heard, they've spent over $10 million, and they're not even near the door of the courtroom. Goodness knows what it'll be at the end. And somebody's got to make that money back, so it's got to trickle down into something at some point. And we really ought to ask questions about the way in which we've organized our world. You know what? We are the humans that have set up these systems, and we have set up the constraints under which we choose to work. And it isn't good enough to say, but that's how we do it. There was a time when we didn't have the Bayh-Dole Bay Act. There was another way of doing science. I, for a long time, have asked the question, a lot of the high-risk science is actually paid for by me and you through our taxes. What's our return on investment? Well, the answer is, well, we get the benefit of all of these interventions. Like, yeah, I know, but I want some hard cash, right? And I'd like it to go back into my healthcare system. So I don't have the idea that, you know, some company which has also invested downstream in the research is going to try to find me to send me my little check for $2.50. But what if there was a way in which we reorganized the way in which we funded research, at least publicly funded research, to say, you know what, 1%, wasn't that the whole campaign for CIHR way back when? 1% could go back into the healthcare system. It was a different kind of argument they were making at the time. But we ought to think about that. How could we, how should we reorganize the way in which we fund science and the way in which we say back to the population, you want to invest and you will get a return on investment. So my hypothesis is that fast science is in part driven by financial interests and more specifically returns, uh, expectations for returns on investment. And so if we want to move away from that, we have to embrace slow science. I'm suggesting it could be an antidote for that. And it's just to buy ourselves time. And so that's my response to the concerns that some have expressed with respect to hubris. It's just to say, it's not that we couldn't know, it's that it actually takes time to know and we're all busy racing. And sometimes we forget what we're racing towards. <laughs>
So what does slow science do? It calls for improved innovation policies. It calls for a better alignment of research efforts with health priorities. It calls for a new funding model in some sense that doesn't primarily reward velocity. That ought not to be the primary goal or principle. As I've already suggested, it calls for a new perspective in terms of what it means to have return on investment. And it also calls for a new approach to policy making where everyone is accountable to everyone at all times. I say in a way that I think is really important that the more science belongs to all of us, the less likely it is to be misused because we all have an investment in ensuring that it's serving the goals and ends that we all believe in, want to promote, and sort. So let me move very quickly now towards the end. I've been saying this for a very long time. I haven't persuaded anybody, but I keep saying it, and I can keep doing that for however long I'm at it. Um, this is a particular uh, time that was difficult in Canada when, in fact, there was not sufficient funding that was not tied to industry. For those who are Canadian, it had to do with some concerns around uh, funding for Genome Canada. And I was, in fact, on the side of scientists saying, yeah, there's a really big problem when you tie every single research dollar to co-funding. But in that context, I also moved from my support for the scientific community to making claims about what I thought was important, which is that values matter, and we need to think about which values will direct the funding, et cetera. And uh, John Polanyi engaged and basically said I was an idiot. Um, and that's okay. Uh, but basically, I think he didn't understand the claim that I was making. Because I wasn't making a claim about managing research, I was making a claim about allowing social values to inform the way in which we do and think about research. And so that's my claim about the democratization of science. Look at this list of questions. There's no right answer to these questions. These are all value questions. These are all questions about what we care about, where we want to invest our time, our talent, our energy, and maybe our reproductive tissues if we're going to be doing germline interventions. These are all finite resources, right? We ought to be thinking about questions, these kinds of questions, and notice that the answer might not be the same in each of the categories. Instead of just sort of blindly going on saying, well, you know, we know how it works, and we've been socialized into a particular way of doing science, and I think we need to call that into question, and this is a great opportunity for that. This is our Minister of Science, Kirsty Duncan, and she's engaged in a political activity right now, and in the context of an interview with CAUT, which is the Canadian Association of University Teachers, she was asked, what are some other initiatives you're working on uh, to promote basic science? And a number of people are really enthusiastic to have this particular minister, partly because of our recent history. And one of the things that she says is that it's really important to ensure that it is strategic and effective and that it places the needs of researchers first. Well, I'm gonna to say to you as a Canadian, she's got it wrong. She's still my Minister of Science, but you know, that's not what should be first. Interestingly, she knows better too. Why? Because later on in the very same interview, she effectively answers the same question, but now she gets it a little bit closer to where it ought to be. It's focused on meeting the needs of scientists while also contributing other benefits to Canadians. And that's ultimately what science is about. It isn't about individual scientists and whether they win the Gardner Awards or the Nobel Awards, et cetera. It's about making the world a better place. That's why most people go into science, right? Part of it is just the quest for knowledge, but part of it is the desire to use that knowledge to make the world a better place for all of us. And that's what we need to remember in this context. So let me end with my comment about broad societal consensus. I've said we've got this great framework coming out of the NAS meeting in December. You only have to do two things. First, figure out the safety and efficacy, then figure out the broad societal consensus. So broad societal consensus, does that mean unanimity? Absolutely not. Can't possibly mean unanimity. We don't even get unanimity in politics, right? How would we ever expect to get that in ethics when you think about the diversity of the cultures, et cetera? So it can't mean unanimity. Well, what about this, probable certitude? Well, the interesting thing about that phrase is it actually comes from an old work that's about deference of wise men to excellent arguments. And it's purposeful that I say it in that way because then what happens is you can think about it as either intrinsically probable, which means actually the excellent arguments part, or extrinsically probable, the deference to wise men. And so many people in the context of engaging with this idea of probable certitude have said the most we could expect is a provisional commitment, recognizing we may get it wrong. 
But what I'm advocating for is something that goes along the lines of deliberative acceptance. And the great thing about deliber deliberative acceptance is that it values minority views. It actually understands that if you really want knowledge production, you actually need something to push up against constantly, because that's what gets you to sharpen your own views, your own perspectives, your own arguments. And so deliberative acceptance actually valorizes divergent perspectives, recognizing you are moving towards a consensus. And I'm going to end by profiling work done by women in the United States as part of the women's encampment for peace and justice. And this was, in fact, a grassroots movement. They were fighting against the deployment of nuclear missiles. And in that context, they needed to find a way to work together because you had disparate women coming from across the country in the United States with one common goal, let's stop the deployment of nuclear missiles, but no history together, no similarities or whatever. And they actually came up with this statement, which I think is fantastic and that I use all the time in my work. Consensus does not mean everyone thinks that the decision made is necessarily the best one possible, or even that they're sure that it will work. But what it does mean is that in coming to that decision, no one felt that her position on the matter was misunderstood or that it wasn't given a proper hearing. Hopefully, everyone will think it's the best decision. And this often happens because when it works, collective intelligence does come up with better solutions. Now, the real challenge and the problem is how do you do this on a grand scale? How do you do this for the world? Well, I'm going to end by sort of showing you the principles that go with this consensus building exercise to say to you that those are things we can work on globally. So what are the principles? The first one is responsibility. And basically what that means is if you come to the table and you have an opinion, you have to share it. You don't get to sit there, be part of the conversation, and then at the very end when it looks like there's a consensus emerging, you stand up and say, no, no, I actually, like, for the last two days, ten days, five years, I've actually been disagreeing with you, and now I'm going to start talking. That's not how you have a proper conversation. Self-discipline. When that consensus is starting to emerge, we're starting in the room to get a feeling that we know where we're going, you don't block it unless it's for a principled reason that you're able to articulate and defend. Respect, you actually expect to be respected and then you deserve to give that to the other participants in that conversation. You're looking to avoid competitive right-wrong, win-lose thinking because you're looking to move towards a broad societal consensus. And lastly, you understand it'll involve a struggle. It's not going to be easy to get ourselves to that point, but surely it's worth it if what we're looking to do is to build a better world, which ultimately I assume is what we're trying to do. The last recommendation coming out of the forum was that this was the beginning, not the end. We needed to have an ongoing conversation, and I'm happy to report that around the world, in different venues, we are starting to see that happening. And it's a commitment to public engagement, but ultimately I believe that's a commitment to talk about science literacy and ethics literacy. That's what we need. We need to encourage everybody to be able to be part of the conversation. Too much of this conversation and many others has been in a very particular narrow group of people. And certainly at that meeting and since then, there's been a fair bit of effort to say there's a lot of other people that have ideas and perspectives and that can and should be invited to be part of building that broad societal consensus. I'm leaving here to go to a couple of other meetings, and this is the last place I'm going to end up is in Berlin, and this is a museum that I'm going to be speaking at in terms of bioinnovation. And what I think is fantastic is some of the speakers are there are talking about do it together science, and mine is do it together ethics. And I think that there is this kind of understanding that there's a way that the two of us need to interdigitate. The roles of scientists are important in this conversation. And basically, what we need to do is to think about the different ways in which we understand it. These are two scientists that I think are familiar to many of you, Kathy Nyak and Robin Lovell Badge. And the interesting question is, what's the same or what's different about the way in which they see their role? It's one thing to say science will merely inform what may be possible, which is kind of a distancing from what is, in fact, the policy-making initiative. And Robin saying, well, it's actually got to be more inclusive. It's not one for scientists to make alone. But it goes beyond that. I have two more slides. I'm not going to talk my way through them in the interest of time and being able to move into the conversation. But it is just to say that there is a literature out there that actually sort of tries to demarcate different potential role for scientists. These are two, the pure scientist, the science arbiter. Here are two others, the issue advocate 
the honest broker of policy alternatives. In the context of what I'm calling for, which is a commitment to science literacy and ethics literacy, I want to be joined by scientists that want to be honest brokers of policy alternatives that are going to try and tie up certain kinds of science opportunities with certain kinds of public goals and objectives to see which it is that we ought to be making choices about. And this is just some of my recent efforts in the context of the ethics literacy. I run a blog, which is for the general public in terms of the level at which we write. We have a Twitter feed, a Facebook, and it's all about uh, having conversations in ways that are accessible in terms of public education. Thank you very much.